This video could not be made without the support of the members of my Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash if you too would like to support this channel. So Hollywood recently released yet another biopic about a famous tragic dead person, Elvis Presley, but since this time it was yossified by Baz Luhrmann's extravagant touch and helmed by Vanessa Hudgens' sexy ex-boyfriend, we were all tricked into being excited about it. Curses. <laughs> Elvis 2022 is, for all intents and purposes, a dazzlingly mediocre movie. It seems that even Baz Luhrmann, innovator extraordinaire, can fall victim to the tired tropes so characteristic of the biopic genre. Elvis is, at best, a forgettable submission in the canon of tragic male artist stories, and at the very worst, a startlingly incompetent portrayal of a historical figure with a complicated political legacy. But even then, nothing is worse than a movie that isn't even good at being bad. While it, like its other musical man counterparts, generated mixed to favorable reviews from critics, I think most people can agree that Baz Luhrmann's Elvis will be lost to the sands of time soon enough, a fate suffered by almost every other mid-biopic that lurches out of the Hollywood machine each year. And to me, a resident fan of astonishingly bad movies, Man, everybody got AIDS and shit. There is no fate more terrible than this. Now, there are many people out there who enjoyed watching Elvis, and that's okay. But I think we need to examine why Hollywood keeps churning out so many middling stories about real public figures every single year. As I expressed in my Death of Cinema video, the industry is already being bogged down by an abundance of safe, hyper-commercialized, unoriginal big-budget movies, leaving no room or funding for original, low- to mid-budget projects. And biopics play into this. They occupy such an uncreative space in the realm of movie making that it's hard to consider them as anything but cynical attempts to capitalize on the already exploited names of often dead public figures. But am I being too harsh? I think we need to do a deep dive into the biopic and to maybe ask what the hell it is, where the hell it came from, to get a better understanding of why we're here today and also maybe why we should slow it down a bit. I'd like to take a moment to thank this video's sponsor, Casetify. Casetify is constantly innovating protective and sustainable phone cases made with style. Your phone is something you carry around all the time, so you don't need it to be built like a brick to be protective. Casetify recently came out with their latest protection technology, EcoShock, as part of their iPhone 14 Impact series. It features over 20% increased protection, which is five times the military standard, meaning it's been drop tested 130 times. And best of all, they're really slim. As someone who drops her phone constantly, I'm used to having super bulky cases, but Casetify sent me four of theirs to try out and they're really cute. And it's great because they still offer maximal protection. I'm gonna do a drop test just to show you how good this technology is. Okay, I'm testing my Casetify case to see how it drops. Let's go. Stunning. Not broken at all. Casetify works with over 300 artists from around the world. I personally really like these colorful designs by Mexican-based artist Ana Levy. So you can choose from an exclusive and diverse range of really cool artist-created prints, or you can play around with their customizable options too. But what I love most about Casetify is their emphasis on sustainability. Casetify's iPhone 14 cases are made from 65% recycled and plant-based material, and are partially made from upcycled phone cases as part of their Re-Casetify program. Casetify's push towards a carbon-neutral future has actually been recognized by Fast Company as a 2022 world-changing idea. So if you want to get some really cool sustainable phone cases, go to casetify.com slash broedechanel today to get 15% off your order. That's casetify.com slash broedechanel for 15% off today. The biopic is as old as Hollywood itself. From the earliest days of cinema, the industry was creating films about the lives of real historical figures, from General Custer to Joan of Arc. But what exactly is a biopic, or biographical film? In a seminal 1992 study, Biopics, How Hollywood Constructed Public History, George Custon defines it as such. A biopic then, from its earliest days, is minimally composed of the life, or the portion of a life, of a real person whose name is used. But if we're to go with this definition, the categorization of a biopic is extremely broad. 
Biopics can range anywhere from a full-life biography of a real person to a fictionalized version of a single moment in their life. It's hard to even classify it as a genre since a biopic can be anything from a comedy to a thriller. The only thing really tying biopics together is their use of a real name, promising the audience a degree of realness from the story, even if some or most of it is made up. For the purposes of this video, when I reference a biopic, I'm going to be referring to a film that chronicles a significant portion of time in the life of a public figure. So yes, this will be excluding Spencer, as much as I'm dying to talk about it. Biopics were being made as early as the 1910s, and from then on, slowly became a major fixture at the Oscars. In fact, the first film to receive double-digit nominations from the Academy was the 1937 film The Life of Emile Zola, a biographical drama about the influential French author, which would go on to snag the Best Picture win, too. The Life of Emile Zola is an early example of the inherent flaws in the biopic genre. And funny enough, it was actually written by Hannah's great-great-uncle, Norman Riley Rain. She actually has his Oscar sitting in her family home, so... I'm just gonna let her take the reins on this one. Oh, hi. Okay, so the life of Emile Zola followed the French writer from his early life up until his involvement with the Dreyfus Affair in 1896, which is where Richard Dreyfus was wrongfully convicted of being a German spy within the French government. It's well known that a major component of the Dreyfus Affair was the fact that he was Jewish in a strongly anti-Semitic culture. But if you watch the life of Emile Zola, you will notice a glaring absence of any mention of anti-Semitism or even the word Jew, which is hard to fathom today, but it's important to note that at the time of this film's creation, the Nazi party was in power in Germany. And this definitely played a role in the version of the film we would end up with today. Whether it was because they didn't want to rock the boat with Germany or out of sheer self-preservation from studio head Jack Warner, who himself was Jewish, the result is the same. A watered down version of history concerned more with a profit margin than the truth. In what is now the great Oscar tradition of the biopic, the film slayed at the Academy Awards, making me the Nepo baby I am today. So biopics are not new, and neither are their controversies. Custin locates the source of why these films tend to garner such a divisive response. The fact that real names are used in biographical films suggests an openness to historical scrutiny and an attempt to present the film as the official story of a life. And while such openness may indeed be a pose of a film's producers, it nevertheless is publicly presented as a natural state of film narration. Hollywood biopics are the true versions of a life. In his survey of the biopic's history, Custin identifies their peak as occurring in the 1950s during the final days of the studio system, arguing that they more or less died out in the 1960s with the rise of new Hollywood and director-oriented filmmaking. The reason biopics were so able to flourish during the studio era was because, like I said in my other video, old Hollywood studios liked safe bets, which resulted in a saturation of conservative, sanitized films, biopics included. As original mid-budget character studies started to gain mainstream attention in new Hollywood and later high-spectacle blockbusters, the biopic had little place on the big screen. Custin finds that for most of the 1970s and 80s, biopics were relegated to the small screen, with the exception of certain experimental projects like Sweet Dreams in 1985, Superstar the Karen Carpenter Story in 1987, and The Doors in 1991. But 30 years out from when Custin was writing, we can see a very sharp turn in the cards for biopics almost immediately after his book was published, beginning more or less with the release of Spike Lee's Malcolm X in 1992, starring Denzel Washington. Perhaps because it was made under Lee's deftly artistic hand, or because Denzel is an astounding actor, Malcolm X is an admittedly great film. It would go on to earn Washington an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor, beginning the long trend of prestige biographical films getting Oscars acclaim for their lead actors and basically nothing else. As of this year, three of the five nominations were biopics in both the Best Actor and Actress categories, yet only one of these films, King Richard, was actually recognized for Best Picture. I think a major reason biopics are such a shoe in for acting nominations is because they're really easy to judge from a technical standpoint. Rather than discerning whether an actor is adequately embodying the nuances and essence of an original character, who we've only become familiar with from the start of a film, a biopic presents us with a concrete rubric to judge a performance. All we really have to ask is how accurately this person is portraying a real figure, a figure whose essence we've come to be familiar with over the course of their career. That's part of the fun of it. As Custin finds, one could admire the past life depicted while worshipping the very real current incarnation of this life on the screen and off the screen in publicity materials. 
It's the novelty of assessing how much Jessica Chastain physically transformed herself to become Tammy Faye Baker, or how adequately Gary Oldman can do Winston Churchill's accent. It's not something innate within the actor necessarily, it's something tangible that we can see for ourselves. And I think it's just one facet of why biopics are having such a strong resurgence right now. We're living in a time where, similar to the studio era, major production and distribution companies are relying mostly on safe bets to make money. And as history repeats itself, they have a major interest in dramatizing the lives of real figures for a number of reasons. Audience familiarity with a historical figure or celebrity creates an embedded interest in the film before it's even released. Humans are also naturally curious beings. We love to poke our noses into the dirty details of famous lives. Narrativizing a life also contains a classic storytelling structure within it. From birth, rise, potential fall, and death, a life essentially writes itself, alleviating much of the storytelling burden from writers. Essentially, looking at it from afar, the biopic is kind of easy and lucrative. But beyond the fact that biopics are a surefire way to get people in their seats, and at this point a guarantee for acting nominations, there's another big reason audiences, studios, and directors keep coming back to them. Dennis Bingham puts it like this. At the heart of the biopic is the urge to dramatize actuality and find it in the filmmaker's own version of truth. The function of the biopic subject is to live the spectator a story. The genre's change, which dates back to its salad days in the Hollywood studio era, is to enter the biographical subject into the pantheon of cultural mythology, one way or another, and to show why he or she belongs there. Biopics are kind of an experiment in vanity. For the director, who wants to find their truth through a famous historical figure, to seize an opportunity to critique the Hollywood system through one of the safest Hollywood mechanisms possible. For the actor, who wants to draw parallels between themselves and a larger-than-life figure. I mean, Ana de Armas is already claiming to be haunted by Marilyn Monroe. Like, babe, Marilyn has dragged herself out of the afterlife to haunt so many actresses at this point that it's becoming a full-time job. And for the audience, all of whom want to feel close to a public figure, to feel like they have a special connection to this person, like they know them more intimately than anyone else. The novelty of watching these films is in discerning how closely they resemble the real world. The word we're looking for here is verisimilitude. In life, and in art especially, verisimilitude means giving the appearance of truth. Annalie Letasalo posits that biopics thrive upon this concept. She says that when watching a biopic, the spectator is aware of the act of looking and recognizes the reference to the historical past, knows it is an illusion, but takes pleasure in the exciting verisimilitude of the presentation. Thus, the special enjoyment a biographical film provides is a cinematic trick of sorts. The past is astonishingly enlivened. We are able to see and hear the person as if alive before us. The pleasure we derive from the verisimilitude of a biopic is an illusion of authentic intimacy between ourselves and the real figure, similar to the intimacy that the director and lead actor also feel to this person. But this is a bit of a gimmick, no? It's this kind of cheap catharsis that we get from going, hey, this looks a lot like real life. While the movie doesn't have to do much beyond mimicking real life to convince us of its relevance or value. So in my opinion, harsh as it is, biopics are cheap gimmicks more than they are art. And that's why I think they're so easy to get made, especially during this current crisis in cinema. Which brings us to Baz Luhrmann. Baz Luhrmann has one of the most distinctive filmmaking styles of any director working in the past three decades. His oeuvre can best be characterized as cinematic maximalism, with films full of extravagant, flashy visuals, heightened performances, rapid-fire editing, tongue-in-cheek references, and a deliberate embrace of artifice. That is to say, nothing about the film is natural. In her comprehensive breakdown of Lerman's filmography and legacy, Pam Cook likens him to being more of a showman than a director. Lerman exploits the exhibitionist nature of cinema, putting all the elements of the medium on display. In that sense, he can be seen as a new kind of showman auteur, a mixture of entrepreneur, performer, and artist whose work harks back to the early cinema of attractions. The attractions that Lerman draws our attention to are the various affordances the film medium has to offer. Look at this swooping transition. Look at this uncanny Parisian apartment building or CGI-generated shooting star. He has no interest in realism because the fun of his films is in how completely constructed they are. What really makes them so special is that they're a celebration of film as an art form and a medium. 
Now, Lerman is no stranger to adapting classic stories and figures for contemporary audiences. In 1996, he came out with Romeo plus Juliet, a contemporary adaptation of Shakespeare's famous story about young star-crossed lovers. And as I explore in depth in my Shakespeare video, this film is completely irreverent of its source material, bending Shakespeare's dialogue and the genders of the characters to create a tale for the postmodern age. And it's wonderful. Lerman breathes new life into this story, and he does it with such a distinct edge that it's just a joy to watch. On the success of Romeo plus Juliet, Elsie Walker considers, If the filmmaker can exploit the potential of cinema to place the language in a new space, a space where it sounds a little different to the ear, precisely because it appears so different to the eye, then it achieves its maximum creative potential. Lerman proved his creativity with a host of other well-received films, Strictly Ballroom, Moulin Rouge, and Australia to name a few, but it wouldn't be until 2013 that he would attempt to adapt another well-known story, The Great Gatsby. Like Romeo plus Juliet, The Great Gatsby would be an irreverent take on F. Scott Fitzgerald's classic, incorporating a decidedly contemporary soundtrack featuring music from popular artists like Lana Del Rey, Jay-Z, and The XX into the 1920s world of Jay Gatsby and his peers. The Great Gatsby, although not a favorite of mine by any stretch, was generally well received when it came out, with people praising its inventive use of hip hop to harken back to the rebellious and hedonistic nature of the interwar years. Tessa McLean notes that Lerman's approach to The Great Gatsby provides the opportunity to open a dialogue and ask new questions about the socioeconomic context of the drama, particularly through his choice of musical styles. Sifting through interviews with Lerman, it's clear as to why he was so drawn to Gatsby as a character. Here was a film about a person who had come from nothing, from a dirt poor farm background and who had created himself, and he could have made himself illegally wealthy and been this fantastico for corrupt reasons, but actually it turns out he has a cause, and is for all the issues of the heart, and this makes him a hero. So he is the most romantic of anti-heroes if you like. Lerman seems enchanted by the very romantic perspective of Jay Gatsby that Fitzgerald crafts in his novel. But both in the 20s and in the early 2010s, this romanticism is ultimately at odds with the social critique of American materialism and inequity that Fitzgerald establishes with his setting. As McLean points out, despite bringing the novel's themes into the present through contemporary music, Lerman has utilized musical styles to celebrate rather than investigate the American classic, preserving and perpetuating the romantic utopia of the American dream. So while Lerman is an innovator when it comes to the technical elements of cinema, he is not one to provoke the social order of his stories. This would eventually become central to his overwhelmingly uncritical portrayal of Elvis in the 2022 film. Elvis 2022 is a mess. <laughs> The film is framed through the perspective of Elvis's real-life manager, Colonel Tom Parker, played by Tom Hanks in some truly horrific prosthetics and delivering one of the strangest attempts at a Dutch accent I have ever heard. The only thing that matters is that that man gets up on that stage tonight. The story begins with the colonel on his deathbed, advocating for the fact that, despite what many believe, he is not to blame for Elvis's eventual downfall. Jump to 1940s Mississippi, and we see a childhood Elvis developing a strong fascination with black music of the South, having grown up in a predominantly black neighborhood due to his family's abject poverty. Now, this is the beginning of a consistent pattern in which the film mentions in passing Elvis's proximity to black music without ever analyzing this relationship beyond that. Years later, and Tom Parker, now running a CD carnival, witnesses Elvis perform with a band and notes the power of Elvis's onstage sexuality, which is reminiscent of black musicians of the time. Elvis is played by Austin Butler, whose star barely existed beyond his romantic unions to much more famous women when he joined the film. Butler is doing his best Elvis impression here, the efficacy of which is hard to judge because he says all of about 10 lines throughout this entire film, although his singing performances are pretty great. Oh, and they also do this really weird thing where they try to emulate The Great Gatsby by incorporating contemporary music. Like at one point Doja Cat plays, but it's so sparse and jarring. And for a movie that's about music from a very specific time period, it just like really doesn't work. Anyways, Parker uses his sketchy convictions to persuade Elvis into letting him have sole control over his career. We then see through a series of long performances and montages how subversive and divisive Elvis's sensuous performances really are, garnering a significant degree of backlash from white conservative Americans who viewed Elvis as stoking racial tensions by corrupting white youth. This culminates in a series of legal battles on the basis of Elvis's sexual and racial deviancy, which the movie alleges is what ultimately led to him joining the US military, which... Mm, 
This is when we get to the much anticipated, highly controversial meeting of a 24 year old Elvis and a 14 year old Priscilla, the ages of whom the movie makes no care to mention. Instead, we get Priscilla, the pretty teenage daughter of a United States Air Force officer. And then we move merrily along. Priscilla, for the most part, is barely a character in this film. This is kind of the case for just about every character, including the king himself, which I'll get to in a bit. Elvis is discharged, and then we're treated to a very, very, very quick montage of his very prolific film career, followed by the lovely union to his recently pubescent redacted bride. Jump again right into the 1960s, and Elvis feels as though he's slipping behind the times. More montages and a very jarring incorporation of the assassinations of MLK Jr. and Bobby Kennedy, people who the movie makes no mention of up until this point, which are portrayed as watershed moments in Elvis's life. So deeply moved by King and Kennedy's murders, movie Elvis vows to lean more heavily into activism through his music against the Colonel's wishes. This period in real life was the big turn in Elvis's career from subversive rock artist to the comeback king vinyl suits and all, which the movie paints as having derived from Elvis's interest in civil rights. Strange? Yeah. The comeback is so successful that Elvis is booked to headline a show in Las Vegas. More montages, more full performances, Elvis is a massive sensation. Having never left the US, he expresses a desire to do a world tour, which is a big no-no for the Colonel, who, as we later find out, is an undocumented immigrant. During one of Elvis's performances, the Colonel negotiates a contract which absolves him of all his gambling debts, so long as Elvis commits to a very long residency in Las Vegas. Elvis unknowingly agrees to this deal and is enraged when he eventually finds out about the Colonel's betrayal, outing him as an illegal immigrant on stage in front of thousands of people, which Again, strange. More montages as we see that Elvis's unhappiness with the situation sends him spiraling into a crippling drug addiction. His mental and physical health rapidly deteriorate. Priscilla, who may as well just be a cardboard cutout at this point, leaves him and takes their daughter Lisa Marie with her. Montage narration, and Elvis, only 42, is now at the end of his life. So weak he can no longer stand during performances, he sees Priscilla one last time, and in romantic Gatsby fashion, expresses his fear that no one will remember him after he dies. The film then ends with an admittedly beautiful mashup of Butler and the real Elvis singing Unchained Melody, as the final titles so typical of biopics let us know what became of everyone in the film. The Colonel dies alone and broke, Elvis dies too, but at least he's remembered by millions. Okay, so from my amazing summary, the movie doesn't really seem that bad, and it isn't really, it's just kind of nothing. Lerman's usual fast pacing and flashy visuals are so over the top that they ultimately undermine the story being told here. There is so much time spent on wacky transitions and quick montages to move us through the four decades of Elvis's life in two hours that we miss out on so many important details and nuances. Even worse, because we're flying through the plot, we never really get a chance to know Elvis at all. So much of what makes biopics compelling to audiences is that authentic intimacy we feel towards a public figure, but Lerman is so focused on Elvis's larger-than-life persona that we kind of come out of the movie not really knowing him any better than we did at the start. By using the Colonel as a foil to Elvis's hero, Elvis ends up becoming a very passive character who has little agency, which results in a rather condescending take on a very formidable force in pop culture. And that's a shame, because Elvis's hyper-commodified image has drowned him to such an extent that the public really has no idea about Elvis the man. I think this is largely a symptom of the biopic as a genre, which one, comes with a lot of legal constraints. The music and life of a public figure who's died usually is owned by their family or by a corporate entity. Queen had a major hand in shaping Bohemian Rhapsody, and because they were so worried about doing harm to Freddie Mercury's legacy, it resulted in a pretty half-baked telling of his life and the life of the band. Priscilla Presley is the owner of Elvis's estate, which is probably why we got such a lukewarm take on their relationship in the film, and also such a flattering portrayal of Elvis. What made something like Superstar the Karen Carpenter story so groundbreaking, and what led to its eventual blacklisting, is precisely because Todd Haynes completely circumvented legal debts and ended up making a really interesting experimental art film as a result. Biopics also have to do a lot of condensing of an expansive amount of source material. I mean, how many events happen in a single life? How many people do we become throughout our lifetimes? So we end up barely scratching the surface of anything other than like a few key moments in someone's life. Biopics in the narrativizing process tend to whittle complex lives into a single overarching theme. And I think the most egregious mistake of Elvis 2022 is that it whittles Elvis's entire legacy, his entire life, into this single, very misguided message. 
Elvis spent his entire life wanting to be subversive. Remember when I said at the start of the video that Elvis 2022 is a startlingly incompetent betrayal of a politically fraught figure in history? Well, yeah. Lerman's insistence on running this through line of Elvis being a guy who wants to be subversive really sidesteps much of the murkiness around Elvis's legacy. Almost every contemporary musical genre we have in America today, from country to rock to pop, can trace its roots back to Black communities and cultures. For centuries at this point, Black musicians have played an integral role in shaping the identity of American music, yet in typical American fashion, they've been systemically uncredited and underappreciated for their influence. Much of the sounds and lyrics of Black music in the early 20th century stemmed from the plantations, where enslaved people used their music to express feelings about the experience of subjugation as a means of reaffirming the humanity that had been stripped from them. Some of these songs, called work songs, which traveled orally around the South, featured call and response forms from the West African tradition to keep a high rhythm and enforce collective action. Music would also travel by way of religion, as it was understood to be a communication with God. Solo parts of Black religious music in the South were intended to express suffering, while the choral parts expressed hope. This genre was referred to as shouting. These forms, created both to lend strength to community and to externalize emotions, would later become the bedrock of rhythm and blues, which itself became a bedrock for many contemporary forms we know today. Black music first officially entered the commercial world with the advent of race records in the 1920s. Race records, a title given to all music made by black artists for black audiences, included blues, jazz, and gospel. These records, which sometimes featured white artists on their covers in a bid to sell to white audiences, were largely relegated to secondary status in the industry. It was also around this time that we would see the meteoric rise of Tin Pan Alley, one of America's first and most successful commercial musical entities. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, classical composers were getting pretty experimental with their music, which made it pretty hard to listen to for the average Joe. What the composers at Tin Pan Alley did was publish simple tunes that were playable for more amateur musicians, which were much more digestible for everyday people to listen to. Tin Pan Alley, creating proper American-born music, has had an indelible influence on the popular music of today. But its later success also signifies a long trend in American musical history of the white establishment ripping off and diluting black music for white audiences. In the early years of the 20th century, Tin Pan Alley slowly began to incorporate elements of ragtime, blues, and jazz rhythms into their music, all genres of which were innovated by race music of the time. American musicologist Charles Hamm has been quoted as describing Tin Pan Alley as having, quote, skimmed off superficial stylistic elements of a type of music originating among black musicians and used these to give a somewhat different, exotic flavor to white music. As the years went on, black songs largely entered the mainstream through covers by white artists. And in the process, many of these songs, which could sometimes be overtly sexual in tone, were censored and sanitized for white audiences. Of course, music history is not easy to trace, and much of this evolution could be seen as a natural process of borrowing, as many black musicians also covered songs written by white folks, but as scholar Lisa Tomlinson notes, over the years, you see in the 1920s and 30s, black music was very underground, very benign, marginalized. It was seen as sleazy. In a lot of cases, when this music becomes mainstream, it becomes disassociated from black experience and black context. We talk about cultural appropriation. We reduce it to just borrowing or sampling, another reductionist term. Borrowing or sampling sounds like nice words because they sound like an equal exchange, but there's a power dynamic embedded in that borrowing. With the Great Depression, the production of race music was significantly halted, beginning a new decade where rhythm and blues would slowly enter the mainstream in a more integrated way. Around the early 50s, America would see a burgeoning youth culture, as young people were becoming increasingly disenchanted with the conservative establishment, and thanks to the post-war economic boom, more able to postpone the responsibilities of adulthood than their parents. As the beatnik movement began to rise, young white people were more and more drawn to the perceived rebelliousness of black music. Artists like Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Sister Rosetta Tharp, Arthur Big Boy Crudup, Fats Domino, and Little Richard, with the inventions of the electric guitar, 45 RPM record, and amp, contributed to developing a new genre that blended the stylings of rhythm and blues and country to create a fresh new sound which would appeal to young audiences. They called it rock and roll. 
This period is pretty complicated because right as black rock and roll artists were beginning to cross over to young white audiences, white artists were continuing to cover black music and still finding more financial success. People like Pat Boone, who would come out with covers of songs by black artists almost immediately after they were released, were instrumental in sanitizing early rock and roll sounds. I'm to the boot. So the culture was one where black music was marginally more accepted by the musical establishment, but the work and innovation of black artists continue to be exploited for the commercial gain of their white counterparts. This is the environment that Elvis Presley came up in. Sam Phillips, the record producer and founder of Sun Records, who got Elvis' start, infamously said, and I'm going to change this quote a bit, If I could find a white man who had the black sound and the black feel, I could make a billion dollars. This quote, racist as it is, gets to the heart of what made Elvis so subversive for his time. What was revolutionary about Elvis that the movie really drives home was that he was one of the first white singers in America to explicitly embody the overt sexuality and sound of black music. And that's what Phillips so coldly taps into with his comment. America, especially its youth, were in the mood for the fun that black music afforded them, but most record companies were not willing to take a chance on black artists who they believed would not sell to white audiences, and also who, due to segregation, physically couldn't play in white venues. So for them, Elvis was the ideal solution. What the movie sidesteps is Elvis's very complicated and often fraught relationship to black music. So movie Elvis really loves, appreciates, and honors black music. The film does a lot of work to show us how active he was in the black community during the time of his ascent, even going so far as to depict him hanging out with B.B. King and Big Mama Thornton, who are reduced, like every other character, to passive admirers of Elvis. Like I said, whenever the issue of racial inequality comes up, the movie simply doesn't push it any further than a passing mention. At the beginning of the film, when the colonel and his carnival troop first hear Elvis on the radio, they like marvel about the fact that he's white with no further comment or critique. No, they are not putting a colored boy on the hayride. That's the thing. He's white. He's, he's white? When Elvis watches Little Richard perform at a black nightclub, B.B. King tells him, I would love to record that. If you do, you'll make a whole lot more money than that kid could ever dream of. And then the scene just cuts. Overall, the film just seems to take a very neutral approach to the issue, rather than showing us the harm it did to black artists and communities. Elvis covered a number of songs by black artists. That's All Right by Arthur Crudup, Hound's Dog by Big Mama Thornton, many of whom did not make even a margin of the success off their songs that Elvis did. Crudup himself had to work on a farm to earn a living during his own music career. Big Mama Thornton made only $500 off of Elvis's cover of Hound Dog, which sold 200 million records. Of course, the blame here lies more with the systemic barriers of the music industry, but there's no real evidence that Elvis ever really did much to lift his black contemporaries out of poverty or to give them the practical recognition that they deserved. Again, I say his legacy is complicated because some of the black artists I mention here, B.B. King in particular, defended Elvis Presley right to the end of their lives, arguing that he opened doors for black artists because he was blurring genre lines. King even stated in his autobiography, Elvis didn't steal any music from anyone. He just had his own interpretation of the music he's grown up on. Same is true for everyone. I think Elvis had integrity. And to Elvis's credit, he did acknowledge that rock and roll had been around long before him, and that he could never sing as well as someone like Fats Domino. But whatever doors he opened along racial lines was largely done indirectly. And other artists took a harder stance. Little Richard argued that he should have held the title of king. I sang rock and roll a long time before I presented it to the public. I really feel from the bottom of my heart that I am the inventor. Ray Charles was even more upfront. To say that Elvis was so great and so outstanding, like he's the king. The king of what? I know too many artists that are far greater. He was doing our kind of music, so what the hell am I supposed to get excited about? So really, to paint Elvis as a beloved ally to the black community is a major stretch. As I said, the movie is incredibly fast-paced and chock full of montages. But the one thing it does choose to ruminate on is the civil rights era and its alleged impact on Elvis. And all I can say is at this point, we're just making shit up.
It was not in Elvis's best interest to take a direct stand in the civil rights movement. So while the film can speculate all it wants about how much he believed in it, there's little evidence that Elvis ever spoke up on behalf of black people. And in the second part of his career, Elvis went from being a provocateur to, well, an establishment shell. And that wasn't just musically. In 1970, Elvis requested a meeting with Richard Nixon in pursuit of a federal narcotics badge that would allow him to travel around freely with guns and drugs. He told Nixon in a letter that he was willing to help the country should he be given a badge, and that he was on Nixon's side in the war on drugs, ironic, I know, and quote, communist brainwashing. They met up and he got his badge. I honestly think Nixon would have done anything to get anyone to like him at this point, even this guy. That same year, Elvis offered to be an informant for the FBI. In a bid to get the job, he accused the Beatles and Jane Fonda, among others, of having a bad influence on young people by, quote, disparaging the United States in public statements and unsavory activities. He also called J. Edgar Hoover the greatest living American and claimed that his eccentric dress and long hair were a ploy to gain respect from young Americans who he hoped to sway away from their anti-establishment beliefs. Of course, we don't know what the state of his mental health was at this point, which may have influenced some of his decisions, but yeah, I wouldn't exactly say Elvis was a real salt-of-the-earth activist type. Like I said earlier, Lerman loves a good rags-to-riches story, and I think his uncritical portrayal of Elvis is pretty similar to the way he approached Jay Gatsby. The rags-to-riches story is intrinsic to the biopic genre, sure. But again, we run into the problem of Lerman upholding contradictory sentiments about the American dream in what is meant to be a contemporary adaptation. He wants Elvis to be a romantic rags to riches hero, but he's not willing to acknowledge the pretty conservative implications that come along with that part of his legacy. The movie focuses solely on Elvis's black inspirations, and in doing so leaves out his very white cultural legacy, the country rockabilly one. Elvis is, for many white Americans, the personification of a white working class hero. And because of this, his legacy has been very much reserved for white audiences above everyone else. Eric Doss talks about Graceland, Elvis's former home, which was posthumously turned into a museum, as a pilgrimage for white people, many of whom uphold Elvis as a figure of a bygone white America. Black absence in Elvis culture is due to the concerted manner in which the culture itself has been organized as a distinctive and deified site of whiteness. She also notes a pattern of racism cropping up in his fandom in the decades after his death. For example, many of his fans denounced the romantic union of Lisa Marie Presley and Michael Jackson in 1994. Doss asserts that at this time, proprietors of various gift shops near Graceland noticed a dramatic increase in sale of Elvis flags, banners featuring Elvis's face in the middle of the Confederate battle flag. So as much as the movie would like to convince us, neither the living, breathing Elvis nor his legacy were ever as entangled with civil rights and activism as it would have us believe. But a true romantic hero cannot be complicated. He must be fatally altruistic. And that's the version of Elvis that the movie would like us to see, a fabricated one. It would be unreasonable to assume that biopics are a beat-by-beat, -beat accurate portrayal of someone's life. For one, movies need to have entertainment value. If we're to narrativize someone's life, it has to be interesting enough to keep the audience watching. And for another, a piece of art more often than not needs to have a message. Directors and writers hold a certain degree of artistic license when making a biopic and must construct the life around a message that they wish to convey to their audience. And that's not even getting into the legal obligations. But ultimately, this is why I don't see much value in biopics at all. And I think Elvis, because it fails to even meet the expectations of the biopic, is one of the worst of its kind. There are two big questions I want to leave off with. The first is this. What is the purpose of a biopic if not to reveal a certain truth about someone, and then to project this truth onto our greater society? What most biopics end up concluding is that no matter how famous they are, there's a little bit of X in all of us. A public figure's rise and or downfall is a reflection of the culture they lived in, a culture not so different from the one we live in today. But if we're stretching and fabricating the life of a real individual, some films more extreme than others in the case of Elvis, then we erase the truth and all we're left with is a bunch of projecting. And truly, that's a major disservice to the person whose life we're supposed to be honoring. As Custon so aptly puts it, in making the lives of the famous fit particular contours and thereby controlling normative boundaries of actions and lives, these films cultivate the interests of their producers, presenting a worldview that naturalizes certain lives and specific values over alternative ones. 
When we look at Lerman's film, we can see him squishing Elvis into the mold of what he and what he thinks contemporary society would like him to be, shaving off all the unwanted flaws that made Elvis, well, human. And like I said, what makes Elvis 2022 so much more frustrating than the other mediocre biopics I've seen lately is that it doesn't even do the one thing that the genre has value in, showing us that authentic intimacy. I think Lerman's style is fundamentally contradictory to the biopic genre because their strength lies in their hyper-realism, or verisimilitude, a realism that his filmmaking style famously rejects. So ultimately, with Elvis 2022, we don't even get the cheap catharsis of the biopic format because we aren't privy to the real Elvis at any time during this film. Thurman's innovative techniques just don't work with what I think is a very stale genre. The second question I'll leave you with is this. What is the purpose of a biopic if not to revisit someone's legacy from a new lens? When we look back at history, all we see is an ever-shifting set of systems and paradigms. And if we're turning to history in order to move forward and make progress, this can be really hard to make sense of. As Joel Gordon writes in his study of political biopics in Egypt, it is precisely the personalizing of history, the selection of heroes and villains in a conventionalized format that renders the biopic potentially so powerful, its value resting in its role as a benchmark for the reconstructing of a shifting public notion of fame. Human beings are more naturally inclined to understand individual faces than they are to the vast set of invisible systems that run our world. The power of the biopic, then, is shaping public history around a few great faces. We excavate those faces time and time again, perform autopsies, and use what we find to assess our own current political and cultural landscapes. This process is, for Gordon, an exercise in political self-definition with reference to the past. But projection often distorts reality, and in doing so, it distorts public memory. Elvis 2022 eschews the history of a figure whose legacy was very much entangled with the systemic co-optation of black music and culture, a legacy that also reveals our culture's permissiveness towards the predation of underage girls. No, he didn't. There was um, an agreement, I guess, he made with himself that the woman that he decided to take for his wife, he was going to keep her that way and, until he married her. Keep her a virgin no mm -hmm. matter what. Right. And honestly, while neither of these parts of Elvis' life are flattering to him at all, I think they're part of what makes him such a fascinating person to study. Elvis was complicated. He was subversive, loving, tragic, but he was also self-serving and politically opportunistic. He was a human being who did good and bad things in his life. And if we're going to remember him, we should remember him for all of it. This is why I don't like biopics. Because beyond the fact that they're cynical attempts at making money, beyond the fact that they're often really mediocre and forgettable, they play a huge role in shaping public history. And if we're going to be gleaning history through the lives of a few great people, and whittling these lives into palatable narratives with traditional heroes and villains, then the version of history we end up looking at is a false one. Special thank you to Louis Osta, Syed Hassan, Malpertui, Cooper Stimson, Nina E, Nadia C, Nick, Jenny Eller, The Wiz Daniel, D.H. Klein, Juvaria, and Nina Ray for supporting this channel.